Some of you seeing this logo already somewhere. If not, you're not really amazing because it's there on the Mosa, it works and it's in the middle and the center. Down. It's about software craftsmanship in, in Germany. In fact, the old logo was in Germany, but now it's not only Germany, it's Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, which are the common German speaking countries. That's why the name Softwax Kammer is for. It's like a, yeah, a strange word. In, in Germany, we have a Handwerkskammer, which is for the crafters. So we say we're not Handwerk, we're software. Software. And what's it about? It's about software craftsmanship, and it started here on the Socrates. 2011. And uh, it was, in fact, I think, the, the first conference on software craftsmanship on, on the European continent. There has been conferences in Great Britain before, done by Jason Gorman. But for me, it started as an agile coach. I've been in the agile community, doing a lot of work there, doing scrum coaching. And someone, I thought, hey, if you want to do software, do software, not coaching. Yeah, just program it. Just bring the code to life. And that was something I was carrying on for, for about two years. And after the end, I said, I want to do the conference, like I take, the conference which I want to be in to visit. So the conference wasn't there, so I created it. and brought it to life in 2011. And about 50 people came, which is not too much, but it's, it's a good start, and the people liked it so much, they said, hey, we want to do our own community. We, we don't want to end it when the conference is over. We want to continue with that. And so we had Sandro there. He helped us founding a community, but London is uh, different from Germany, and the amount of engaged programmers in London is much higher than all over Germany. <laughs> so I had the idea that probably it's... Um, good to, to keep it together because otherwise everything is too small to be on its own feet. But at the moment we have 17 regional groups. We are more than 800 people registered on the software side, on the software, software summer side. And all over Germany we have about 20 events a month or even more. And uh, the main thing was we wanted to do something which makes it easy for anybody to, to found a local group and to make events on the local group and to, to organize it. That was the goal. And um, we are looking at <coughs> providers like Meetup. That just didn't fit. Then we found one, but as you'll see, that didn't last very long. But we wanted to trust, so at the moment, we have a site where everybody can be like a group administrator. If you want to be a group administrator, you will become a group administrator and we trust you at the first time and if you do something wrong, then probably we talk to you. But we don't have the problem at the moment. We have privacy. We are one of very rare websites. We have no tracking of you. We have nothing, not Google Analytics. We don't know what you do on our website. We care. We don't know, and privacy is a higher value than knowing what to do. And everything is transparent. You can see what it is. You can see the code, yeah? and you will see the code. And it is very simple because, of course, we are not very good at UI design. It's a spare, it's a free time project. We do it in our free time. So it's all simple, and first thing is it has to work, and then it has to be nice. So we started in Group Spaces, which is from Great Britain, I believe, and they offer you the service. You can host your website there, your community platform there, and they have subgroups which fit our needs. And at the beginning, it looked quite good, and it was a little bit slow, and performance was not so good. But even that, they brought better and then better and better, and suddenly they wanted money. <laughs> you want money for what? Yeah, because uh, we can give you additional advertisements when you pay. So you had advertisements if you don't pay, but you also had advertisements when you pay. And we said, 
okay, but the service is not the best, so we were slightly pissed. And at that moment, we were thinking, what alternatives do we have? Yeah, we can go to Meetup, yeah, but it doesn't work with the subgroup. We can go to some German providers, we didn't like that. And so we said, hey, we're all programmers, and maybe we can just do it ourselves. It shouldn't be so hard, yeah, it's just a website with some email lists and some wiki and some activities and as you will see it was growing a little bit <laughs> and uh, we started it developing last year in March and uh, so it is last year which was in <coughs> August like every year we switched from group spaces to our own platforms so it was about five months to go live and now we have it cheaper, we have a better service because we are our own first, second and third level support. <laughs> which is quite easy because my girlfriend is also one of the main committers, so I just shout over, hey, what did you do? <laughs> and she can fix it, yeah? Or I, or she says, hey, fix it yourself. <laughs> this is how the site looks. You will have a yeah, live view soon. And um, it's quite simple, a little bit of bootstrappy, probably people who know bootstrap see that, and it works. Yeah, technology. Of course, when you make a website, you probably need some programming language to do that with, you need some platform to run it on, and we are all people in the core team, we were all Java programmers. Yeah, so as a Java programmer, what do you want to do? You want to do Java, and then someone said script. Said, yeah, why not? Why not JavaScript? Because Java is a little bit fat. And the provider we were talking to, we were wanting to go, he said, you want an app server here on our shared host? No way. It's too fat. I said, okay. Yeah, and then we wanted to learn new technologies, like Node.js with an express stack. And we also wanted to play around with NoSQL databases, so we chose MongoDB. And after a while, we had a wiki, and the wiki is based on Git, which is quite cool technology because it gives you all the versioning and the histories for free. And of course, the front end is HTML. And the last thing is the, the simple list server because it's not very trivial to have mailing lists, yeah, because of the bouncing and people not there or you, you get spam, so you somehow have to have quite quite a few of logic. So we said this will take from, from something else which is running, which is open source, which you can take. And it was quite a pain, but we made it to run without root rights and that was a problem because it's written in Perl and the only interface we can have is via SOAP. So we had a SOAP interface in a Node.js as Node.js client goes to a Node SOAP server, which is the simple server. And you will see this uh, is quite a little bit complication, especially when you want to test it at home, because at home you don't have this list server. Of course, yeah, it's a quite big thing to install and very, very complicated. And the development, how does it work? We are mainly two committers, me and my girlfriend at the moment. But Everybody is invited, and tomorrow the local group from northern Germany will add a new feature. They want to do it in a sort of hacker garden, and they are planning a feature. And they want to do that tomorrow, at least they want to start with that. And we also have contributions from other people, so everybody who wants to have a feature is invited to do the feature, and we help. It's no problem. We are hosted on GitHub. We have Travis for uh, continuous integration. Locally, we tell the people to use WebStorm because we have a community license. If you're committed on the project, you can have a community license, so it's free. We have a slightly 80% coverage of unit tests. We are using JSLint online for, for checking the code quality. For people who use uh, Windows computers, because we experience that many people have problems installing the software locally on a Windows machine because of Node and Node uses native libraries and has to compile them with a C compiler, so you need a C compiler there. And it's a pain in the ass to make that run on Windows machines and some people made it in 
two hours, some in seven, and some just didn't manage at all. So we have now a vagrant integration, which is setting up a local uh, virtual machine on your desktop, so all the software is run in the virtual machine and run on uh, Linux. So this is quite cool, and we try to automize as much as possible. So this is our GitHub front page. We try to explain everybody how to set up the project on his or her machine, to work with it and to make it run, to make it compile and to play around. And this is uh, how the build looks when it's running in Travis. You see all the dots are running tests and you see the coverage just to get an impression. But I will show that live later. Design is quite easy because we are coming from the Java world. We made three tier applications with a database, with Node, uh, which is a Mongo, and with a server, and the server is preparing pages and delivering the pages after the client. And so it is very, very easy to test because you put in a URL and then everything runs, returns, that's it. Nothing else. So it's low tech, so otherwise I wouldn't have understand it. It's no fuss, it's just plain design. But, as always, we have some things we don't like so much. We are not so many people, if we're just two at the moment, mainly. And uh, that's not very much feedback we get. Yeah, we get feedback from the code, of course, we listen to the code. And we get feedback from people when we meet them, but usually we are a little bit shy, as all developers are. Yeah. Even if I don't look shy, yeah, I am. And we are not going to be, hey, hey, please, please tell me. Because, in fact, probably we are afraid of getting bad feedback, so we better do not ask. But, in fact, we should receive more feedback and integrate with people more. The UI design is not our strength. Yeah? We are not front-end people, we are back-end people. And the UI is a little bit old-fashioned, a little bit yeah, boring, I guess. And some. Sometimes the performance is also not the thing which is like something we are really happy about. And we are missing some tests. We don't have really tests for the UI. We have some tests testing how the produced HTML looks and then if there is special code in it and special text. But we do not test the UI as, as you do it in with UI testing. We have not so much integration tests, and we do not have a staging environment at all. So usually when we deploy, it's like fire and try. <laughs> and sometimes it was fire and try and roll back. <laughs> Happens. Yeah. And now it's time for you to ask me what you want to see. Because I have everything here on my machine, except the simple. But I will start from scratch with a, a little introduction to the code, so you get a better impression of it. Where is my mouse? Switch it on now, right? Um, some of you have experience with the Node.js JavaScript. Okay, so you will now see a new world, which is Node.js, which is JavaScript on the server with a stack. It's called Express. Express is like a set of uh, functions helping you to make a web app. And uh, it's a little bit like the um, Java, how do you call it? Um, yeah, where, yeah, where you get a request and, and a result, and you just can fill it, yeah? So 
everything is coming with functions giving you some request, which is a little bit prepared, so you don't have to, to pass the request, but the request has everything you need. And then you just fill the result and give it back to the client. And here, we set up the application with lots of modules you need, like configuration, like Beams, which is sort of a spring stuff, and logging, internationalization. And then we say, OK, we create the app with middleware stuff, which is preparing the re request. And then we have our own middleware, which is not very detailing to go. And now we have the app which is administration module, and activities module, members, groups, stuff like that. You can see it in the app. This is the live app here. I'll do that in full screen. And I'll switch it to English, so most of you have more fun. And uh, there you can see the app, and we have these activity stuff, the group stuff, the wiki, the member stuff, the administration is here. There you can just have some tabular views of, of our content, which is not so interesting. And uh, so everything is set up here, and then you have a quite, quite simple <coughs> structure of the, the application because everything plays here in the, in the LIPS module. You see the same structure, activities, administration, announcements. And we don't try to, to mingle the stuff. Yeah, we, we have, for example, you see here the Groups app. So the Groups app is living here. You go to the index of the Groups app, and then You see the same setup again. It's typical node setup. You see, I need this, I need that, I need that. It's just like the imports in a normal Java. And then you say, hey, if somebody is saying, because the prefix for groups is groups, saying groups, he will get all groups. If somebody wants to create a new group, we will do this. And so it goes. And I'll go to the bottom. This is the function that is executed when you say, show me the group named group name. Like when I go here, and I'll show you the Karlsruhe group. That's it, it's groups and the group name. And then this here is done. What do we do? So first we make a small function inside the function, which is no problem in JavaScript. If you're new to JavaScript, that's a surprise because you can Define stuff in stuff in stuff in stuff in stuff, and at the end you don't know where you are. <laughs> but it's fun. And now it comes to the other stuff I told you, which is the 3D architecture. So on the top we have always something we call an index, which is uh, the app, and below that we have something we call the API stuff, where the logic is. So at the moment, we don't have too much business logic. It's more like a yeah, user interface for a database with a little bit of logic, especially because we have to mix the simple results in. So here we have a module that is concerned with stuff for groups and for members. Yeah? And so we say, hello, somebody wants to see information about this group. And so give me the group and members for that. And I get back the group. And the group is filled with members. That's why the method is called groups and members. And this here is typical node. And if you've never seen that before, it's really a little bit confusing. Because the result of this function is here in this parameter, groups, or group. Can everybody still follow? Normal callback. And then you have bus code, which is usual node code. If something is bad, then we just do error handling. And then we go to the wiki and ask the wiki for the blog post for the group. 
which is the part here on the right side. So in the first call, it was the group stuff and the members, and now we get the blog posts additionally. And then we ask, is the currently logged in user part of this group? Is he in this group? And this will be a Boolean, and we put the Boolean here. We say the group has organizers, they're there. We have blog posts, and we have some URL where we can get the iCalendar for, 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 for an iCal abo. So you can put it to your own calendar. That's all. And this is everything that happens when you call this URL. Of course, the magic happens here. This is a little bit more complicated. You say, give me the group, add the members to the group, and call back. Or here, where we have some git calls. And this is yeah, a little bit more code. And then, at the end, we render it, and rendering is done with Jade, which is a templating language. Where you can handle URL a little bit differently, uh, HTML. So you just open the stuff and you don't have to close it. And depending on the indent, it's the next level. Uh, this is uh, the most fragile stuff we have in our application. I really love it, but at the beginning it was like a little bit pain in the ass because a friend recommended it to us and we said, yeah, we tried and we found it quite good. And if you're, not, if you're new to it, I think it's a little bit hard to read. Yeah, for example, these are just uh, diffs and you just uh, name the class. So this is diff class is row. This is div class is call md12. And you just don't have to type the div because it does it automatically. If you don't have anything, it makes a div. And so it's getting less fuss in the code, in the rendering code. And remember, I put all these variables in the result here. Like user is group member, organizes blog posts and everything. And now I can refer to these variables here, and this is the uh, uncool part of web programming on the server because you just bring the stuff here by, by strings. Yeah? So there is a string called blog post, and in the blog post is the blog post, and then I can include here like a, another component, a J component, rendering blog post. So, questions? Uh, one advantage for using Node.js is that you can uh, reuse the code on the client. Yeah, that's what we thought too. Uh, the question was that we can use the, the same code on the client as on the server. Uh, yes, what I want to ask you is uh, if you do that and uh, what's, what uh, will you use on the client? Nothing. We don't reuse nothing because <laughs> it is not really reusable. The, the only thing that is reusable is the same programming language. But usually the server code you don't need on the client. The only thing we need on both sides is uh, validation of inputs. And that has to be done differently because on the one hand side you make a validation on every field immediately as you do the input. So you need different rules and then to, you need to put the rules in a different way on the other side, you do it with another framework on the server, so which is slightly different, and so you cannot do that on, with the same code. That's a pity, yeah. About the uh, uh, MongoDB model, can you show us? Or? Yeah, the MongoDB model is very, very simple. And uh, what we didn't do is, the question was showing the persistence, right? Yeah. And we had uh, to talk about uh, what do we want with a persistence. 
And then we were thinking about using a, a mapping tool like Mongoose, but we decided against it. Yeah, we are we're coming from the Java enterprise world. We are using with Hibernate usually or JPA, and we really love this stuff. And then we thought, do we need it here? I don't think so, because what we want to do is we want to put some Java string objects whoop, to the database, and probably next month we need new fields, and we make a new field. And then they are in, and probably we have to write a small migration script, and that's it. This worked out quite well. The data structure is simple. We have, uh, as a core, for example, here in the groups, <laughs> we create a uh, sort of object for, for all our things we do persist. So this is the persistent group. This is the object which is coming from the database, and it has some fields. And we just copy the fields to, to the JavaScript object. So we can work here and we have sort of yeah, classes to, to put some methods on, to put some yeah, behavior on the objects. But this was what we did in the beginning, and we do it still for most of the objects. But the most complicated object we have at the moment is the activity. Like the Socrates, this year all the registration is done in, in here in the app. I can probably show you, because then you get an impression of uh, this thing is a little bit bigger than it has been in the beginning, because you can have payment information on the activity, you can have additional information where you are asked for an address, for a t-shirt size, and uh, all this stuff is then saved as part of the activity. So when I show you the administration for the activity, you have general stuff, you have some resources like a single bedroom, a double bedroom, and what everything can do. You have additional information which you can say we need 100 deposit and stuff like that. And everything is then saved in the Mongo. And this was uh, quite, yeah, not, not feeling good anymore. So we switched to another model. And the model has proven quite cool. We are, I'll show you in the activity directly. We are not copying the values anymore. We are instantiating it with an object and we save the object completely in a state. And then this state is used to create the sub-objects. So part of it. So we just have a facade for the state and the facade has the behavior, which is a little bit more overhead, but it's much more powerful to have nested structures. But it took us a while to, to figure out how to do that. And then, of course, as a Java programmer, the first thing what you do is you have a variable here, a state variable called id. And then you want to have a function called id. It doesn't work yet. Because you can use the, the thing only, the name only for a function or for a property, or for both. And that's what it works. And if we have relations like the group, the members, or the member in the activity, we just do it by hand. We save the IDs of the of the objects, but not the objects there. That's the combination is done really manually, which is a little bit like antique. Yeah, we did we did that in the 70s. Yeah, but we do it now, and it feels not bad. It's not a big application, and it's a good way to go at the moment. Maybe some of you wonder if we have tests, <coughs> or do you think we don't need that? What? No, uh, in fact, it's overrated. <laughs> and uh, we have two sorts of tests. We have tests on the back end and a few tests on the front end. The front end tests are not too big. The thing is, what we want to test on the front end primarily is, I can show you locally probably, if I make a new group. It's like with any other object. You have a form. And in the form, you want to check something. And you want to give error messages if 
if it doesn't work. And uh, we want to check if the checks are okay. So these are the front end tests we have. And to have them, we need a DOM. But we only have these JAD files. So we compile all the JAD files together to one HTML fragment file. And then we have a DOM. And we can execute the test, which is quite simple. On the back end, we have two stuff. We have a test with database, because we have um, concurrency. So many people want to register for an activity. And if two people want to register at the same moment, and we only save the whole activity, you don't want that the second person to register is kicking out the first, because of concurrency reasons. So we have optimistic locking. And then we have tests that the retry mechanisms or the exception mechanisms are working. And to do that, we really need the database. Otherwise, we cannot really check, uh, test it reliably. That's what we did here. And here we have lots of tests for other stuff, like for the groups. We have a group test where we check what happens when, when you start up the application. We can check the API functions. We can check the objects functions. And we do that, and it works out quite well. And if you run the tests, I can do it locally here. We use Mocha for that. And then you can see how they execute it. Some of them are quite slow because they need to compile the JAD files, which takes quite a while. But that's yeah, 14 seconds. I think it's quite OK for, for an app with integration tests. It was not only unit tests. So far, so good. I have five more minutes, I guess. So, more questions, more wishes? Yeah. How many clients you are able to serve? I don't know. I don't know how many clients we are able to serve. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you have problems with the... Uh, I don't know if we have performance problems. We have a, a hosted server with a provider called Uberspace in Germany. They are sort of alternative hosters. They are a bunch of nerds. And you can get an account there. And it costs you one euro per month or more, depending on how much you want to pay. That's their philosophy. And we like that. And they have really good support. And uh, we share a machine with about, I think, 500 other users. So it's not too fast. Yeah? So I can show you one feature, which is a quite new feature. And all, yeah, not, it's not really activated. It's hidden. You don't have to know the URL. It's a dashboard. And there you can see that it's quite slow. Because it's collecting now all my group information, all the blogs from the groups, all the emails from the groups and everything. And this takes a while on the server. But once it has assembled all the stuff, it's just one HTML page. And if we're lucky, it will return sometime. <laughs> but I told you that it's one of our sore points. And, and this was where we really said, we think we have to do something for the performance, yeah? because this is too slow. Now it's there. Yeah, this is not funny. And now when I, when I reload, it's faster. And it is because I restarted the app yesterday, and the group information from the SIM part is cached in the app. But if it's not cached, it takes a while with all these soap calls. The soap calls are really pain. This is killing our performance. But once it's there, it's quite fast. Now. So we can check stuff here. And yeah, that was that was a call. Yeah, it's not not in the page. Yeah, there's nothing. And this is just loaded on demand, and it's not a fat client. It's just single, not a single page app. It's just done when you click. And so far, we didn't have uh, complaints from the people. We have complaints that sometimes it's not reacting because uh, our hoster is swapping it out if there are no calls for hours or something, then nothing happens, so it takes a while until it's going up. It's coming back from the virtual memory. But once it's running, it's quite responsive. So, uh, in your 
opinion, what was the hardest thing when transitioning from Java to JavaScript for you or for the team? The transition from Java to JavaScript, the hardest thing was to find out the new paradigms and how, how to apply them. Because I am a, a really passionate object-oriented programmer and it was quite a big thing to, to let loose that. To, to, to forget about inheritance and just use functions, probably sometimes have a function where you put some object and you work with the object, so it's not like tell, don't ask, it's more like do something with a JSON object. And this is not feeling good at the beginning, but after a while you, you see it's, it's more functional programming and we have lots of um, stuff there we do in a functional way because otherwise it wouldn't work anyway in Node. And Node is really hurting you in this. If you're not going functional, you probably shouldn't start. Yep. Why not the client-side templating? Why not client-side templating? Uh, in the beginning we didn't think of that, so we just didn't do it. And um, I don't see the reasons why I should do it. I, I'm not in this discussion. This works good. If you have arguments, please tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really willing to get feedback from you. If you've seen something, where is it? Are you, are you stupid? Why are you doing it like this? Please explain me. Let me know. I, I'm willing to learn, really. You can also go to GitHub, look at the code, try it out. If you have questions, just mail me, Twitter me. I will help you. Believe me. And I think I'm in time. One more question, two more questions. I'm here all day. You can always ask me. I can show you the code in private. We can, I can help you install it on your machine just as you want. Thank you.